off top, there's no actual species of cat called panthers. It's just all highly melanated. Big cats are considered panthers. So in 1995, when we added the jaguars and the panthers to the NFL, really just added the jaguars and the jaguars. Hey, music. This is the Dominique Foxworth Show. Welcome to the Dominique Foxworth Show. Weird facts is where we're at. I, I think I've weirded out our guest, Marshall Newhouse. He don't know what he's in for. It's a wild ride with me and my man, Charlie the Snack Kravitz. What's up, Marshall? Welcome to the crew. Man, what's up with y'all? I appreciate you having me. And honestly, the cat part, I'm very familiar with because I got two nephews and they're in their cat phase. <laughs> so I went to see them I over the holidays. It. We went to the zoo and the Jaguars... The pan- the panthers, as you call them, that are yeah. the same thing, basically. They're just in the cat, big cat phase. You, so so I'm with you. Mina tries to make fun of me because I do all my shows. I start with, like, facts like that. And she's like, that's what kids like. So? Kids yeah. are awesome. <laughs> yes, I'm a kid. I like to have weird science facts thrown in my face every now and then. Do I want to actually do some science? No. F- that math. But tell me something. Tell me something interesting every now and then. Like we don't actually ever touch anything. That's that blow my mind. I'll be happy with that. There's Man. a there's a disturbing amount of my my brain capacity stored just for dumb trivia facts. Oh, and I'll it. keep it that way to the day I die. Because you know what's life worth living if you can't just spout off some random fact about ice cream sometime and blow somebody's mind you know what I mean? love ice cream <laughs> oh, you, got, you got charlie yeah. you got charlie charlie you just say the words ice cream in the same sentence and he will get excited you okay. have a lineman on so i mean what we can oh. go wherever you want to go yes. let's go um <laughs> we'll, 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 let's definitely talk some football so unique opportunity here we'll talk we'll, we're going to talk some new stuff also but marshall you played for two of the coaches who didn't get jobs in this past cycle who were thought of as like the hottest names and Bill Belichick and Mike Vrabel. Vrabel in particular was someone who we thought was going to be at the top of everyone's list. It seems like he'll sit out a year and get a job next year. Belichick gets a little bit more murky in his 70s. But my question to you is off the top of this is, who are you more surprised didn't get a job this offseason, Vrabel or Belichick? Man, I, I was asked this a lot in Vegas and I, you know, I'm not, I feel like my answer got repetitive, but as I've had more time to think about it, it went from Belichick to now. I think Vrabel was the bigger surprise because of the youth factor. Like as we, you think about Bill Belichick and all that comes with that, both the positives and the, the football knowledge, the situational awareness, building a program, all that stuff. You understand that there's a lot of weight that comes with that, with his, you know, our perception of his desire for control of, of an organization. So Vrabel, to me, you know, they, given what he was working with most of the time at the most important position, which is QB, man, like, to me, that felt like a guy that could instantly take you from uh, an 8-8 eight eight level team, I guess we got 17 games now, but a, mid, a mid-tier a mid team to a playoff team, just in the margins. Dominic, you know this, just the NFL is really, yeah. we see the trash teams and we see the Super Bowl teams, but honestly... They're yeah, not difference. that far from each other. And each, yeah, yeah. and each step along the way, and a coach like Vrabel, you know, being there, I was there in 2020 during the COVID year, and even in that short time and in the weird circumstances, you understand the stuff that he took from his Patriot days, but you also understand those little things that he, he paid attention to on when the game's on the line, my guys being more prepared, tougher, and just in a better headspace those will get me the wins. And I don't care if I win by one, two, or three points, but those stack up in the win column and those get you to playoffs. Those give you a chance. Maybe I got to give a speech this weekend. I wasn't sure what my topic was going to be about kids, but it might just be about trade-offs in life. Mm. Because I feel like that's a lot about this decision for these um, these coaches. It's about trade-offs because you can speak to this better than I can, but maybe you don't want to because you play for both of them. They both seem like they might be hard to work with. <laughs> and, and they are. And I know I, I, during Vrabel or during the CBA negotiation, Vrabel, or even before the CBA negotiation, when Gene died, we were looking at executive director. He was on executive committee. So was I. I spent for a couple of years a lot of time with Mike Vrabel. And Mike Vrabel has very strong convictions about the things that he believes and there are ways to do it. And it, it seemed pretty clear that the issue in Tennessee wasn't with the on-field product as much as it was uh, collaborating between all the, the um, sectors of the organization with Mike Vrabel. And you could also yeah. understand that Bill Belichick, 
he has a way of doing things. And when you get to a certain age, you ain't going to change those way of doing things. So I feel like that's the probably the more honest answer for why those guys didn't pick up. It's not because they're not good enough, because yeah. what comes with them is a certain way of doing things that isn't easy for everybody. For sure. And, and the thing I kept noting, too, to people was this is a scarcity field. Yeah. There's 32 teams and every offseason, there's anywhere from four to eight openings. So there's already a reduced amount of opportunities. And you've got to – and also, you know this from being on, on the, you know, the, the uh, CBA negotiations. These owners don't answer anybody but themselves. So what, who's going to tell an owner or override an owner if he just doesn't vibe with what Belichick's asking for? Or if in the one anonymous case, Vrabel being 6'4", with a, with a barrel chest standing over him, intimidates him, who's going to tell him no? So <laughs> – at the end of the day, it's a scarce, you know, field. Yeah. On top of that, you've got men, uh, some women who are worth, you know, hundreds of millions and billions of dollars who the final buck stops with them. And so it, it, Vrabel might have sneezed wrong and he said, ah, he's not the one. And we can't say anything about it. Like, that's ultimately their decision. I think Tennessee was in a place where their ownership was trying to be in line with, I think, will end up being a good hire in Rand Carthen. Yeah. Um, and what they're looking for to build a program moving out. They got a, a $3 billion stadium that's on the book. So they're, everyone's trying to, you know, a lot of the image is part of that, perception is part of that. And so I, I understand why they moved on. But both Vrabel and Belichick, I just describe after all these years and, and, and seeing things play out from both in the locker rooms and outside, it's just demanding. And not everybody's up for demanding. And that's okay but, you know, I would you'd hear about guys before I got to New England that would go there and leave and like, man, this is trash. Like they're doing da 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 X, Y, Z. And so I got there and, and the circumstances which I got there were crazy on itself. That's a whole story I can tell. But it's just demanding. And like I grew up as a as a coach's son, at least up uh -huh. until, you know, like seventh, eighth grade. And so like discipline and like be, someone being just like really hard headed and. Um, all that stuff was, wasn't was new to me. So I was like, all right, once I settled in a little bit, I was like, all right, this is same old, same old. It kind of sucks because it is demanding, especially I was in my, I was in year 10 when I was with oh, yes. New England. By that time, you're going to tell me I got to do <laughs> Oklahoma drill after practice? Uh, you're going to tell me I got to run hill it. gassers after practice? <laughs> yeah, that's bizarre. I got to squat heavy on Fridays after practice? So it's just all that stuff that, you, you know, I, I say – you know, I'll keep PG, but like as you get older and just in football in general, it's just a reoccurring uh, business decision where you got to say F it. You got to you got to weigh that risk reward personally of like from every hit to hit. Are you going to are you going to turn it down? Or are you going to go in there every weightlifting session? Everything you got to say F it or not. Yeah. And if you, as soon as you start saying <laughs> not a whole lot. That's the best description of being a professional football player as as you are becoming an adult. Yeah. Because you show up in the league, you're a kid, you're a boy still kind of, and you and your your um like default position is right. Like generally, that's how eighteen to twenty five year old men yep. they the way that they think is kind of like eh, all right, yep. let's go do it. But then when you get older, you're like, man, am I gonna say it again? That's essentially the question that you're asking yourself yep. at the beginning of every season before and the later it gets. It's like oh, and before every play, you're like oh. Am I going to say it again? <laughs> then eventually you're like, man, I can't say it no more. Yep. I got to go at home say, and uh, go about my business. They We're going to get you for that Patriots story, whatever it is, at some point. Yeah, so, I, I, I'll, I'll tell that one. It's crazy. I mean, and uh, side the side note of that story is I signed in New England on the same day, the same morning as Antonio Brown. That's a whole nother thing. Oh, gosh. <laughs> I took a picture. I don't know, I don't know if I can I can't say it. It's whatever. It's just the front of my signed contract next to his signed contract on the desk. Because I was like, this is kind of crazy. <laughs> but, yeah, like, you you know, as as the years goes on, you know, you just eventually said, man, I don't know if this is worth it for me personally, whether it's the combination of whatever I'm getting paid and what I'm expected to do. Uh, Chase Daniel, I've met with him. He's a Texas dude. I met with him before. He's a backup quarterback. So training camp is not much to him. That's probably where he gets his most action is training camp. For me – I've heard more guys retire from the prospect of having to go through a training camp than actually playing football. So it's, mm -hmm. again, it's a balance, it's a self-awareness, and it's like, what are you willing to go through for, whether it's vet minimum or whatever the contract they're offering you or whatever, whatever situation, is that what is your effort? We call it the effort ratio. We'll, we'll put it at that. The effort ratio. What's your effort ratio? Yeah, that's hilarious. Now, the training camp was quite daunting. I think it's gotten somewhat, somewhat better, but... Mm. 
It'd be all year just dreading going to training camp from the conditioning test to the two a days to the to the fake arbitrary. Oh, gosh, you did so well yesterday. We gonna get you ice cream. Oh, we gonna go <laughs> bowling. For me. Like, work for me. Get out of here with this. B Y'all been having this plan. Now you, okay. At the beginning, when you first get there, it feels good. I mean, I it, always feels, it always feels oh. good, but it also just gets annoying. Like, leave me alone. Oh, just on. tell me when my day off going to be. Don't pull this surprise <laughs> like I'm a <laughs> baby. Are you <laughs> training camp ice creaming me when you offer me ice cream like a <laughs> baby? <laughs> she, she, little baby, it's okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, oh. that's that stuff. And the, also the other thing that annoyed me is every year trading camp, the coaches would pick out a day where they're going to get mad and tell us that we that we not serious. We don't want we don't care about it like we supposed to care about it. I'm a grown damn man. I know I know the game that you're playing. Stop playing this with me. Go do that with them <laughs> kids over there. Let me go to work, man. I'm sorry, Marsha. You know, you know, dredged up some some old yeah, sores. This has been repressed for a long time. <laughs> oh no, I, I spit it out every now and then. But yeah, I, sometimes I forget about it, and then a, a football player shows up and reminds me how annoying coaches <laughs> can be sometimes. It's some real, just underlying trauma. I don't remember ever. And so we, you know, off season is was typically after the new CBA, nine weeks long. You get done at mini camp, which is the middle of June. You get anywhere from four to five to six weeks off before training camp. I do not remember one time in that break where I enjoyed my time off without anxiety leading up to camp. Five weeks of just like, damn, who like it's coming. <laughs> e e e count down the lift off of the conditioning tests because I'm a lineman too. Like count. Oh, what's it going to be, man? I'm gonna be ready. What's it going to be? I gotta move in here. I gotta you know go in the dorms in some places. I'm like, bro, this is not fun. This is stress. A month and a half of stress leading up to then more physical stress and emotional stress. I'm stressed, bro. But okay. <laughs> oh, man, this is good therapy. Charlie, you got any other questions or you just want us to vent some more? Well, no, no I do have like, so on the Pat stuff, because you raised a really good point. Like owners, no matter how powerful we think coaches are, owners are not going to take that from a head right. coach. That is really evident in the documentary on the Patriots that's airing now weekly, mm -hmm. The Dynasty, where... It seems like the Crafts use that as an airing of grievances about Belichick for how the Brady run expired more than anything. You were actually there for the last season. Was it like obvious how bad the vibes were between Kraft, Brady, and Belichick? Uh, so I'm actually I haven't watched that. I'm looking forward to just kind of watching all at once. But it eventually got to the point. So I signed uh, like three or four weeks into the season and had to get. Um, caught up really quick. I, I signed on a Wednesday and started a game at tackle on a Sunday. Um, so I had to get, there's a lot of stuff. I, that's the story I'm talking about. I'll tell you another time, but I was just in fight or flight mode. I was just like survive, figure it out. And so I didn't have time to worry about any drama that was latent in the building or whatever. But eventually as I got situated in the facility, got used to the rhythms and stuff, you did notice that like, this doesn't feel like the, all-star, all-pro, Hall of Fame quarterback and this all-pro, Hall of Fame coach are like hand-in-hand. Hand. Now, maybe they never were, but especially once I kind of could take a step back, take a breath and like see things around me, I was like, there is a weird energy in here. Like, you know, I don't know at what point, Dom, you saw vets just get vet days. Yeah. Whatever position, they yeah. took a vet day or they were given a vet day or whatever. I had heard that Tom didn't really take him. I was like, he's Tom Brady. He doesn't need to be out here on a Wednesday, you know, maybe just for walkthroughs. And he's at a certain level, even though he's competitive and likes to work, he's at a certain level. He doesn't need what we all need. And there he was, so many different Wednesdays and Thursdays, the hard-hitting pad days, heavy team period days. And then all of a sudden he wasn't. And he'd miss, he, he'd miss a day. And it felt like it was – it felt like he, he was taking the day for himself and not like an agreed, hey, this is your day. And I was like, oh, that seems like there's friction there. But, I, you know, I didn't pay any mind. I'm just, I'm just minding my business. But it did seem a, a little off. And lo and behold, that ended up being the last year. I remember when we lost in the playoff game to uh, Tennessee. I was just mad because we lost because we shouldn't have lost. Like, we right. tricked it off. But – the guys in the locker room, it felt like the end of something significant, mm -hmm. not just a season. It felt eerie, an end of a season. I remember a couple of guys, my locker's kind of across the way from Brady's, 
And I remember guys going up to him, and maybe they did this all the time, and then asking for him to autograph his jerseys. And that was like, maybe that happens all the time. And I've gotten some guys autographs at the end of the season, but it felt like a sense of urgency with guys like, I might not have seen this dude again. Like, So that's the, that's the feeling I got. I don't know how much of it was real, but that's me being new there. I was just trying to get caught up. That's super interesting, and I think you, <laughs> I think you were right in what you were sensing, but it just brings to mind how it does feel like media in general is changing, and we see guys. We saw Deion Dawkins doing interviews, talking mm-hmm. trash about people. We've seen a lot of guys do these things, yeah. and now the Patriots – our producer, or well, Kraft is a producer, right, on this documentary that seems to be telling the story from their vantage point. Mm. We're moving in a direction that's further from where we started, and where we started, you don't take locker room stuff out of the locker room, and you don't, uh, there's like a statute of limitations where you can start talking about things, and it feels like that statute of limitations is shrinking. It's getting smaller and smaller, which I don't know that I have a question around this. It's just something to recognize. We're going forward that we're going to hear more. It's not going to go back. Like The the guys are not going to get less talkative. There are active players in the league right now with popular podcasts, and not just one or two. It's like six of them. Yeah. (laughs) And some with not popular podcast that will become popular when they start spilling the beans so i don't know what type of world we're headed for but i'm not gonna complain about it because i'm not in a locker room anymore but there are lots of stories that that i've experienced that still haven't been told and i will wait (laughs) until the people who did them tell them and then oh i can't wait no then that's when you get them on our podcast to tell try (laughs) yeah i mean as i'm entering into this space you just recognize that Everything is an opportunity for some kind of content, for better or for worse. And so, yeah, you're right. That statute of limitations that you just have to wait for some kind of NFL films, short documentary, some kind of more formal thing to tell a story. Even then, a whole lot wasn't a whole whole lot wasn't coming out. Now you got some some podcasts. I won't name any that are tantamount to just gossip and pillow talk. Yeah. And so everything in between, but it's all serving the same monster of. We're feeding content in this machine. We want eyeballs. In the, we want this and that. So I'm like. You brought up NFL films, and I used to make a joke about how whoever's in charge of NFL films must, like, they have the tightest security ever. Because if they got people <laughs> mic'd up and none of it ever gets, like, the things that have been said and none of it ever gets Bro. out. But I noticed, like, days after the Super Bowl, they were playing, um, like, mic'd up clips that. I would have never expected them to play before. The one that comes to mind is George Kittle mm-hmm. uh, blocking George Karloftis. Hey, George. It's like, hey, George, <laughs> while the fumble's behind him. And it's like, it's just like exposed. And then also, like, I forgot who it was, but it was a safety, I think, for the 49ers saying that Patrick Mahomes ain't that good. Like, these are things that we say on the sideline between our teammates that we don't expect to get out. But right. he was, I'm like, yeah, of course he knows Patrick Mahomes is great. But you know what? In the middle of a game, you go to your, you got to stop. You got to stop. You go to stop. He ain't <laughs> He ain't <laughs> We got him. But you don't expect that thing to be on Twitter a couple of days later. Like, again, no question, just observation. No, the turnaround is crazy. And then, like, I don't know how, how, how true all this is, but the idea that Travis Kelsey bumping Andy Reid and stuff he was screaming was on Mike and somehow the – some collaboration between the Chiefs, the NFL, Kelsey's people, they're like, let's not have any of that out, at least for now, this early. And, like, you're like, there's a gatekeeper that's like, all right, like, whatever the toll is, the toll is paid, or whatever the, the risk value assessment is, it's paid. You remember? We don't, want, we don't want to hear what this guy said in this moment. You remember a few years ago when the NFL was like, we're going to find uh, – players for using the n-word no matter their nationality and i was like what that is impossible and if you're gonna find for that whoa ho, 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 we're gonna have rosters of six and seven people because there is that and a lot worse that happens on the field but they backed off of that and they have proof of all of it because there's somebody with a mic out there somewhere like i'm sure they can decipher what's happening which there is a, a incinerator in the basement of NFL films where they take lots and lots of horrible, horrible things that we say to each other out there. And we just dap up after the game is over. But it, it could it could never get out to the world, the things that are said. Maybe the kids these days are more progressive and are smarter about their language. I doubt it. No, not when, when adrenaline is involved. Yeah. And 
so, so many guys work out in the offseason so they know each other. Mm-hmm. And that doesn't mean that when the when you're inside the lines that the smack talk dies down. In fact, it gets more intense. <laughs> exactly. Because, like, yeah, we were running routes against each other in the offseason. Yeah. I know. I, I remember. I know the buttons I can't press. imagine. Right. Uh, in 2015, I was at the Giants. And we were playing, at the time, the streaking Carolina Panthers with Cam Newton, like their peak mm-hmm. season. That was the Odell Josh Norman game. Oh yeah, and I'm I'm playing I'm playing tackle and like I'm trying to block uh, who uh, who's the DN? I think it was Charles Johnson and whoever there. You know, I was trying to see where Keekley was. I was trying to do my job. And after almost every play, you, you either see out of the peripheral or you hear guys getting broken up. Odell and Josh all game. I can't imagine yeah, the if the majority of what was went on there was on mic and was published because. Listen, they were going at it. They were both at the top of their game. Like, I don't, I'm not mad at that. But, like, the things that were said, I can't even, like, envision what people would, how they would react we had, if they um, really heard what was going on. When I was in Denver, I, there, I mean, we had to, whatever, stand up for our guys all the time. And there was one time when uh, some defensive players told us what our old line was saying. And then we was like, oh. We ain't got their back. Do do what you gotta do. We can't we can't do nothing about that. Y'all done cross some sort of line. But again, the statute of limitations for my time has not reached a point where I can say what they were saying. So moving on. So I do wanna you, you brought up the name Cam Newton. Okay. The name that's been in the news this week for a, a fight at a seven on seven flag football tournament. Oh, yeah. Altercation. Altercation. Can you call that a fight? Yeah, altercation. Donnie Sc- Brooks, Bruha. <laughs> When I put my little brothers in a headlock, is that a fight? <laughs> no. It is to them. <laughs> Fighting for air, yes. Um, but so I had never seen Cam Newton in person until Radio Row at the Super Bowl. Oh, and man. I think I was one of the hundreds of people who saw him and were like, holy <laughs> that's the largest human being I've ever seen in my life. Like even compared to Cam nice. Hayward and, and Miles Garrett who are walking around Radio yeah, Row. Miles Garrett is a good comp. They're like they're both built like superheroes. Yes. And they got yeah. shoulders that you're like, mm. look mm-hmm. like you got a like a BBL in your shoulders. They just too <laughs> that seems unnaturally <laughs> large. You just got thick shoulders. But so you you played with Cam in twenty eighteen. Your reaction when you saw this clip going viral. I'm just like on so many levels, I'm not surprised for good and bad reasons, like, A, Cam is huge. He was one of the hardest workers I'd ever seen. Like, a lot of people, I think, if they when they meet Cam and, and when we retell the history of his career, they're going to they're gonna regret the way that they talked about him, his career, just for how much he had to do to, like, bring that team to success. Um, but he was, like, kind of the cliche early QBN, but it was, like, genuine. He was just, like, focused. I'm – I'm I'm gonna lead this team, and it starts by being the first guy in here. He's on the treadmill three hours before any of us are in meetings. He's watching film early and late. I remember being late there because I got traded in the middle of the season, trying to get caught up on the playbook. So I'm there late, and he and Keekly are in in the film room, you know, talking through game plans, talking through what each other's seeing, and that's the part of, about Cam that people don't realize. But the size part, like Cam, is a defensive end in any other universe. Yeah. He's a he he is a, a all caliber defensive end and like a specimen. And then I think a guy like you, Charlie, seeing him in person, not that you ever said anything bad about him, but imagine you're walking around and your takes are printed on your face about Cam <laughs> Newton. And you gotta go up to him in person and just like see the size. You're gonna immediately be embarrassed by what you said. <laughs> Not putting respect on this man's uh, name as an athlete, yeah, bro. Charlie. It's crazy. Yeah. It's crazy. Notorious Cam Newton hater, Charlie Kravitz. <laughs> yeah, of the, of yeah. the two of us, <laughs> I'm, yes. the, I'm the Cam hater. Definitely you. Definitely you. Um, you know what I thought? I had this question for you. When I saw that, it made me think of the times when like, I had – uh, scuffles with with normal people. Do you ever? Except you're so big that I feel like you would never have this situation. But have you ever had to like let somebody know, just get a, a, a real firm grab or a shove to let people know that this ain't a game? Yeah. I'm so I wrestled in high school, so there's that aspect because I know how to like grapple and like Don't mess with him. I just know how to like end something really yeah, quickly without without stuff having to really get crazy. And also there's. I call it the, the the bouncer theory. If you look like a bouncer, yeah. it's just a – all it does is disincentivize someone from even thinking about starting something. So, I, you know, I just look big, 
near a door, a front door, and people start giving me their IDs. <laughs> It's the bouncing black theory. Shirt. And so, yeah, just wear a black shirt, a fake headpiece, or just touch your ear, and it's a wrap. I can get, I can get their social security number. So, um, but yeah, like you know, I you know I had to hem some people up for sure. And like you know, my my pops played played football in college at University of Houston. Uh, grew up in South Dallas. Like I can fight. I just don't. I haven't really needed yeah. to. And then also, I live in Texas, so we got got them things yeah, otherwise. Yeah, so yeah. you know, it's not really a problem. But I've had to hem some people up for sure. I was telling Charlie about the time I had in college when I great story. Yeah, my college girlfriend had a uh, she her, one of her high school friends had a pool party, so I went back with her to her home, her area, and went to the pool party. And it's like gets into the night and whatever. As before, I I didn't drink at the time, so I'm sober, I'm chilling, and then people are not drunk, drunk, but like they they drinking and they having fun. They start throwing people in the pool. And they, so they all, we're all in our 20s, early 20s, 21, something like that. And then they start coming over towards her and they're guys that she knew from high school. So like, I'm not going to cause no big thing, but I just like, nah, like waved them off. Like, nah, we ain't going to do that. And they think it's, they think it's a joke. Like, haha, we just play it. Oh, you going to, you going to stop us? And I was like, nah, we ain't going to do that. We'll throw you in is what they said. So it's about four guys who like my size and bigger, but they was regular. And oh, <laughs> I was just fresh off of getting some muscles, tossing them boys around the whole thing. And then at some point, you know, it's like on the line between playing or this could go to something more serious. And then yep. I think they recognized that they could get embarrassed in front of all their high school friends. They better get your hands off me. And then we all <laughs> laughed it off together. Ha, ha, ha. All right. Dap it up. Okay. Go on about your business. Step one, never get embarrassed <laughs> at a party when you're in your early 20s. <laughs> yeah, that's the rule that one. wrong. Yeah. So. That was the time I just wanted to tell you guys I could whoop some if I need to. And that was your that was probably your peak time when your like your squat is at its oh, peak where you're like, I can lift a bus right now. Oh, Please do something. Five seventy five. I was I was I was benching three fifty five. Oh, I was pushing them boys. It was so much fun. Charlie, what about that time when you had to hem somebody up? E? Yeah. Uh well I did actually once Ooh. uh get get accidentally punched in the face uh, breaking oh. up a fight but I was never I was not I was not involved send your frogs Cancun to a friend and another friend spring break sophomore year of college and I was uh. like I should get in the middle of this We're, I don't want my friend going to jail in Mexico and not being able to get him out stepped in right at the wrong time popped um. popped in the chops bloody yeah. lip you ate it um, no I got kicked out of the bar they thought I was fighting it was, it was, <laughs> I was the only one who got who got sent home you caught a stray and you got yeah, kicked out? A, oh, man. What good Devastating. Are the, what good are the curls <laughs> if they don't make you look innocent? Yeah. Oh, well. What else you got, Charles? Um, all right. Let's talk some football news, some stuff that's going oh, yeah. on now. Cool, cool, okay. cool, cool. You guys went through the pre-draft process. The combine's mm-hmm. about to happen this week. And we have something a little bit interesting going on with Marvin Harrison Jr., who mm-hmm. is not just skipping the combine, but might skip the entire pre-draft process. No pro day, no individual workouts. Basically, being like, you know how good I am. You know how hard I work. Whatever, but this is a particularly strong wide receiver draft, that makes it, which makes it interesting. PFF has ten of those guys in the top forty of their big board. Malik Malik Neighbors might be wide receiver one in any other draft, and mm. he's going to run at a pro day. He might run in the low four threes. Do you think if he works out that well and Marvin Harrison doesn't work out, that he could end up wide receiver one in this draft class? What do you think, Marshall? If if someone's dumb enough early in the draft, yes, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Marvin Harrison is that there's every year we, we're going to talk about this forever. There's a handful of guys. It could be five to 10 guys that if they choose to 95% of the pre-draft process is meaningless for them. It is a, it is not worth the risk. All the physical stuff is just not even close to being worth the risk. And there's people that are like pure football. They're like, oh, I want to see him compete and run routes and on air and, and run the shuttle. And it's like, for what? For who? If I'm Marvin Harrison, his junior, was it his sophomore year, his junior year, was wearing an Apple watch in the middle of a game. You think he's worried about doing your pre-draft workouts? And you know who his daddy is? We won't even go down that road. We know who his daddy is. So he is one of them ones. There's always a handful that if, you t- if they told me, hey, I'm still going to interview. I, they need to get to know me. You know, talk to execs, get used to that. That's fine. But all the physical stuff, 
I'm, trust that I'm working out. You can come watch me just do like a workout session, like lift weights, stay in shape. But all the other stuff, the proof is go look at the film. I, I, <laughs> when you, not every, not, no, everybody can move like that, but there's a few every year that can. Yeah, bringing this up just makes me like think about the combine as a whole and like what value does it have considering how much information and access we have now. And I think the combine has a ton of value as far as like coordinating with other teams for trades and talking to other general managers. And I guess maybe it's the first time you can interview players. So maybe has some value there, but with all this advanced stats we have with the, the tracking data that we have access to, on in game, like I'm, I don't think that for anybody. So Marvin Harrison aside, Marvin Harrison, like the resume is there. So like, leave me alone. If either you want me, or you don't, and that's probably true for a lot of players. But I am not sure how much value the combine has, honestly, to anybody other than like as a TV property now as another like NFL tent pole for them to sell to us because I don't think anyone's opinion is being changed. I don't think people are moving up and down the draft board based on unless like you get hurt at the combine or unless you like test positive for something at the combine yep. or unless you just completely tank an interview. Like the, the information is there. You, we know who these guys are. No one's moving up or down. I, I don't think. You don't think there's the any fact that this is like a control where it's like you can see how like you're taking yeah. competition out of it, how explosive certain players actually are. I think what people are looking for more than anything is like confirmation of what they've seen on the field. Exactly. Yes. Right. So, yeah, I think that you would have to be so bad if you like show on the field that you have short area quickness and we see it time and time again. And then you go there and it's like, all right, you're not the best. People are still going to believe that your short area quickness is real on the field. Like you have to go there and completely tank it. I, I don't know. I just feel like football evaluators have enough access to information now and it's not like you can take out the competition element in part because of like the motion tracking data where it's like oh no he actually is that fast we have proof of him being that fast in this situation so i mean i don't know how it could be that valuable i don't know maybe i'm wrong no and then you have to look at the draft process i think it's been described like this more, more recently when i think it's true is man this is this is these are darts yeah. we need like draft positions are just darts and teams are looking to throw as many darts and try to hit as much as they can. But like, there's a whole lot of like unknown that will just never be known. Like uh, that, that little feature they did on Puka Nakua ran like a four, seven as a receiver, but Sean McVay and his GM uh, Sneed, right? Yeah. I think they saw something specific about this dude on film, nothing about his workouts, Nothing about, like, they saw something specific about what he does with pads on. And they're like, that fits us. There's value in the fifth round. We think he'll be there. Let's go get him. And let's, like, inf like there's situations that can arise like that all over the place if more GMs were more intentional about what they were doing. But, again, this is these are dart throws yeah. uh, more the, times than not. And you're looking for many as many darts as you can get because there's guys that look obvious – and they run fast, and then they can't play football. And it's just it, – sometimes it boils down to that. Yeah. I went to the combine with um, – I was there with Bruce Campbell. You remember that name? Yeah. Out of Maryland. Yeah. Explain to the people what Bruce Campbell looks like. Big. Like you, you – the offensive line version of Miles Garrett, like yeah. specimen. <laughs> yeah. Everything looking at him says he should be able to end up being a franchise left right. tackle for 15 years. And he – God bless him. He's a really new, nice dude. I, 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 I rooted for him. I cheered for him. However. Not above me or whatever. But he, he, just, it, he just couldn't yeah. figure it out. Right. And he ran a 485 at 300 pounds. Like crazy stuff. Yeah. Like, what, what? So someone saw that and it changed their opinion of him and they took him. Now, that was back when the Raiders were doing what Raiders, the Raiders yeah. kind of did specifically. But anyway. <laughs> the Raiders just, whoever's the fastest, who's the biggest, you go get drafted <laughs> Those by are the just Raiders. two examples though. So it's, man, like. And also, let's not forget, through this whole process, you know, guys have insurance now, but you're not covered. Yeah. Nobody's protecting you from injury. So, like, if something crazy happens because you're running an L drill, <laughs> you're trying to shave a couple tenths of a second yeah. off an L drill. Like, for what? Doesn't make sense. The um, 
Yeah, I, I think what jumps out to me is like we are, and I think DK Metcalf jumps out to my mind as someone who like actually felt like his stock climbed because of the 40 time that he ran. Oh, I thought it dropped because he couldn't turn. Oh, yeah. I guess that's He was that's the number one point. receiver in that draft. And it's, then he, he, his They dinged him because he couldn't, quote unquote, get out of his breaks. Yeah, that was And a then mistake. the line drill, he like didn't, you know, they say if you, if you back away from the ball as you run down the line and you don't catch it as smoothly, they, they ding you for that. So I think he got dinged. Yeah. Right. So that proves my point. I was looking for well, something to disprove so, my point. I'll take that as prove my point. I've got I one. Like that. I got one that disproves your point a tiny What's bit. That? And this is sort of what I think is the interesting part about the combine is that sometimes odd sized players have great tape and need the combine to explain why they're so good at certain things. And Aaron Donald's like the perfect example of that where he climbed higher in the draft. Of course he probably should have been the first pick in that draft, but he ended up being, I I don't know, the 10th pick. And people are like, is he too small to be an NFL defensive tackle? He goes to the combine and is like first ever in his position group at pretty much everything down the board. And those are the type of things that lead scouts in the right direction when it's not the obvious. Yeah. Okay. That's a fair point. Um, And that's a, yeah, that worked out for him. I think the the yeah, point that I wanted a very low hanging fruit. For me. Aaron <laughs> Donald outliers. is good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, but I mean, it's a, it's a good point because <laughs> I couldn't think of somebody who who fit the mold of like it actually climbed up the draft board because of their performance at um at a combine or a pro day. And I think even as we go further and further into the future, we're not getting less information. So I wonder how much, how valuable any of this additional information is at this point. And we used to make fun of the um, Bengals because they had like the weakest or, or um uh scouting department and like they would save money but like honestly <laughs> like all the information that's available right now you can get access to the film there's 30 people who are credible who are former gms who are out there evaluating film and grading players like you don't really need as much access to players like the combine is a relic of the past when you actually didn't see these players like you you didn't know what they look like you wanted to actually see them yeah. in real life and see them exist and actually see them do things and and you were actually meeting new players like it's, it just feels completely unnecessary at this point I don't want to get away with it I don't want to do away with it because it's fun and it's nice to see it's like the competitiveness but I'm not sure how much value it serves to on a team by team basis but anyway getting redundant Anthony Richardson combine guy my, probably ended up being someone who would have been this. Probably should have been the second quarterback taken. And, in that and draft. To, to tie, the, tie up the point, like all the uh, if a guy pops in the combine, they say it, it makes the scouts just go back and reevaluate re-eval- like, your tape. Excuse me, it makes them just go back and give you another look. So that's that's fine in a certain instance, but for the overarching thing, it, it doesn't make as much sense anymore. Um, so more receivers coming off of. I mean, we launch into the combine stuff off of um, Harrison and neighbors, but. There's something sort of brewing in Minnesota. And the most recent quotes from Minnesota's GM are that they don't want to trade Justin Jefferson, that he's a blue chip person. You try and stack as many of those on your roster as possible. But they're in an interesting situation. You have the best or the second best or the third best wide receiver in the league in Jefferson, someone who's going to get a nearly fully guaranteed contract that's going to shatter what Tyree Kill got. And they might not have a quarterback. Kirk Cousins might walk this offseason. If they bring him back, it seems clear you pay him. If not, and you're building the Vikings, would it be crazy to consider trading Justin Jefferson? Uh, no, it's never crazy. And it just, it just comes down to, you know, risk and reward. That's everything. It's them being self-aware about what they need, laying out their options, and then weighing each risk and reward. The risk of signing him to a, a league-leading receiver deal is that you're hamstrung to then go get another position you probably need. Um, that defense has been struggling uh, ever you know, we used to we used to pencil them in as you know the Mike Zimmer four down front double A gap mug. They would cause a lot of problems. They'd be top ten in the league in most categories most of the time. And ever since that those days, they've been as inconsistent as anyone. Um, and so they've got holes in other places as well. And so you you weigh does Justin Jefferson cover up enough of those holes by us keeping staying keeping our offense on the field more? or scoring more points where the defense matters less or that we can cover more holes? Or is his, you know, value at such a peak and someone willing to pay that price that we can reshape the, our entire team and maybe hit on another guy, whether it's receiver or not, that can still make us competitive? So it's, it's, there's no one right answer, yeah. but no, as I, a, you know. I hate this question be in part because I think that I know what I want, 
is I want to invest in Justin Jefferson. I want them to pay him, and I want them to keep him. But I also recognize that the point that Charlie is going to make, I'll beat him to it, is they're not going to win a Super Bowl with Justin Jefferson, and this team is currently constructed. And moving on from Justin Jefferson and presumably getting a haul, uh, maybe a couple first-round picks or at least one extra first-round pick and some second-round picks is the type of – foundation that you can use to build a championship roster but i hate that idea well, you got a great player don't get rid of great players but it's not it's not just that, that they're not going to the super bowl it's like if cousins leaves they might not be a playoff team possibly yeah no i get it and i i also like the reason why you would never do this if you had a quarterback because quarterbacks are hard to find but then you compounded by the fact that this receiving class is really good yes huge and, part of it and it feels like there are also Future receiving, it doesn't feel like receiving classes are going to start being bad anytime soon because we recognize how important passing game is and lots of young, talented players are going to keep playing receivers. So if there is an important position in football, that is easy to find. If you want to like rank the important positions of the top positions, I think a number one, true number one receiver is up there. But of all those positions, the easiest one to find might be a true number one. If you like thinking number one receiver, left tackle, quarterback cornerback pass rusher yeah pass rusher maybe pass rusher and receiver are probably are you, are you making the case that they should trade him right now hell no don't because it sounds like it you I know t- but like it actually sounds like if because okay jefferson was I a hate seventh that receiver i'm making take. your case but jefferson was the seventh receiver taken when the vikings took him addison was the fourth receiver taken they've hit on these before right. and like it was bold to trade Steph Diggs and draft Justin Jefferson at the time, and it paid off because they ended up with a better player who was cost controlled, and it fit their timeline with Cousins, who was you know at that at that point. But now it's like they're in a different situation as a team, and like of course you want good players in a vacuum. Yes, you always want better players, but to your point, there are trade offs when you're building that roster. Yeah, I hate it. I hate it. You're right, uh, but don't trade them because I like him. But do trade them you know, to win. <laughs> it's it's teams are always evaluating their known knowns, and yeah. is the known known as the number one wide receiver worth? What is the what's, what's he going to get? What would he theoretically get? 30? 30? Yeah, they're, they're saying above. Adams it could be like 30, 35, 35, and it could be a hundred percent guaranteed. Is what's being rumored. So you know what you have in him. You know you've got another three, four, five years of peak Justin Jefferson. Is that known known worth that money? Or, you, like, again, we're talking about darts. Do you take a chance with a, a wider array of really good receivers that one of them does what he does and then you have more to spread out both in top picks with the, with the trade or whatever and then just opportunities? So it's that's a boring answer. But, yeah, I love it. I want to see him get paid. Like, he yeah. – he, yeah. the amount of times he's, he's turned Kirk Cousin ducks into first downs and drive continuing first downs and touchdowns, I'm like – Pay the man like he's we don't have to make that but, argument. So it's this just, is, you know, this is the pushback I would make um, to the uh, I was making Charlie's argument for him and I started to believe it. But this is the pushback I would make is that there are certain players that are there. There's a tier of receivers that's number ones. And then there's a tier above that that I feel yeah. like are good enough to elevate everyone around them. And I think Marshall was just making that point. So as difficult as it is to find the quarterback, you're going to have to find one. Justin Jefferson makes whatever quarterback you have a little bit better immediately. So if you get a good quarterback, he's going to be much better with yeah. him. If you get a bad quarterback, Justin Jefferson has the ability to help make him mediocre. So while you are while you have Justin Jefferson, the bar for how good your quarterback has to be is lower. And that's the hardest position. And like we see that no disrespect to Tua, but we see that down in Miami where it's like, "All right, Tua's okay." But right. that offense putting up historic numbers is a result of them having two receivers out there, one in particular, who just is different. I mean, I'm so happy, too, it's not as big as Cam. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, uh, based on the things that you've said. Yeah. Um, he seems a lot nicer, yeah. too. Just like. <laughs> so I, can, can I give you a hypothetical? Nope. Well, I'm going to anyway. I know. Let's just say you are the Los Angeles Chargers and you have the fifth pick in the draft. And it's the... Would you trade the fifth pick? Wow, for Justin Jefferson. For Justin Jefferson, you could pair Herbert and Jefferson. In theory, in theory, the Vikings would have five and eleven. You're going to get neighbors, and uh, the eleventh pick in what is like a historically deep tackle draft. You could get Olu. You could get Amarius Mims. Who knows if Joe Alt will end up there? Is that the type of thing that supercharges a rebuild 
Tackle talk. I heard tackle, so we need to know um, what Marshall has to feel about that. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't hate it. Yeah. Listen, um, but Jim Harbaugh's he won he went to the NFC he went Super Bowl NFC Championship with Michael Crabtree as his number one. So I don't know if that is something that like he is in need of, especially they've got an aging Keenan Allen and an aging Mike Williams and a young Quentin Johnston. I don't know if if that's where he would want to put eggs in a basket for it. It's to I him. Think- He's trying to have Justin Herbert need to throw less in critical situations and be protected by the run game uh, more. So that doesn't scream, go get Justin and Jefferson and give away draft guy. And they're a team who does need some young, cost control, cheap talent on both yes. sides of the ball. Um, but there's also the argument that you put those two together, Herbert with Jefferson, that everything else starts to matter a little less. How bad your defense is matters a little less. How bad your offensive line may be matters a little less. The non-existent running attack matters a little less. It's a it's an all-in move. That's what about me. That's what scares me about it. Is like, oh, if you do this now, this yeah. better work immediately. If you and and work well, and if you don't, it's a little bit safer, but the the high end isn't as high. But, I mean, with this pick and to the point that we made before, with them having – if they think they need a number one, a true young number one receiver, with a very deep draft, maybe you don't get somebody as good as Justin Jefferson. But, like you mentioned, Jefferson, Justin Jefferson was taken at seven. Right. Uh, they might get somebody who is – I know they tried with Quentin, Quentin Johnson. That missed, but they might get somebody. Hey, man, that's year. my that's my fellow frog. He's going to figure it sorry, out. Y'all get, lay off my guy. Lay we're off not, my guy. We're not talking bad about him. We're just <laughs> pointing out that. Yeah, it's not working out. I just think <laughs> I think finding the break-even point for this is fascinating because it's like yeah. – I feel like two years ago we never would have had this discussion. Like one of the best players in the NFL doesn't get traded in this type of situation. Everything tra- changed after that Tyreek trade. And now it's like we can explore these avenues because people are slightly less precious with players that are this good. I mean, yeah, it's the the you know the Madden mode, the franchise modification of the NFL, mm-hmm. where t- teams are, you know, in, in similar basketball terms, they're they're more they're more creative with how they can exchange value than they they were. There used to be when they're set on guys, the trade had to be very obvious. It had to make a whole lot of sense for a whole lot of people. Now it's like they see value or certain teams value picks in a certain round, certain teams value positions over this and certain teams like to sell high uh, and early rather than hold on to a guy a year too late. And so you're seeing teams be more aggressive with, you know, a a certain uh, approach that they've owned. And I I respect that you just have, you own um, your, your approach to things and then you're still flexible. Like the Rams are my, I, I listen, they were my biggest, Surprise of the season. They, yeah, I thought Tom McVay amazing. was going to run it for coach of the year because they do what they do, but they're always trying to maximize that goes, I mean, their roster. Goes to your original point. The rosters are not that different at talent. While mm-hmm. we talk about the teams that suck and the teams that are great, sometimes if you can create little advantages, you can hit on some draft picks, you create little advantages like you were talking about some coaches can create in different spots. You can turn a team that we don't think is that good into a really good team because – the disparity in talent in NFL is not as big as uh, as we'd like you to believe. Anyway, what else you got, Charlie? Last thing is, um, you know, <laughs> this might be just an, an innocent mistake by the Cardinals social media person. <laughs> Who am I to say? I don't know. But there was, you know, there was the tweet that said, Josh is our guy about Josh Rosen when they got the first pick in the draft. And they drafted Kyler Murray, Josh Rosen. Uh, he's no one's guy. Um, well, the Cardinals and Kyler Murray have had a um, tumultuous relationship over the last few years. It seems like now would be the least tumultuous. He came back and played well coming off the torn ACL. They have the fourth pick in the draft, which, assuming quarterbacks go one, two, three, that puts them in line for Harrison. But they tweeted our franchise QB with a picture of Kyler Murray, and it looks eerily similar to the Josh is our guy thing. So, Innocent mistake or or secretly dangling Kyler Murray? <laughs> it's 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 definitely not a mistake because it was a tweet that they sent out. Whether it's innocent or not, like I don't know. Um, I don't think that they're high enough. Like when they did it to Josh, in the draft yeah. or like or high, oh, yeah, 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 like yeah. <laughs> they're definitely too high, but they're not high enough in the draft. Because when they did that to Josh Rosen and went and got Kyler Murray, they had the number one pick. Mm-hmm. And this year it seems like there's a clear 
kind of cliff after Drake May and Caleb Williams. And the other guys might turn out to be much better. Maybe they're grading these guys higher. But to me, for I guess we would say Jaden Daniels is the next guy. Definitely. We agree Jaden Daniels is the next guy. Jaden Daniels is taller than Kyler Murray. But other than that, I'm not sure that Jaden Daniels is a better passer or a better runner than Kyler Murray. If that's so, I guess you're moving on. If you do make that move, you're moving on to get away from Kyler Murray and to get the cost control quarterback. But it doesn't seem to make sense to me. Man, we are in peak lion season. Yep. <laughs> as soon as Super Bowl's over, it's lion season. Uh, Even a seemingly innocent post like this, uh, it's trade craft. It's <laughs> it's because, yeah, like they could they, they're they have plausible deniability. Hey, these are number one. Look, we posted it. That means everything, right? But um ultimately it comes down to like leverage and like, do you think Kyler has the aptitude you know, as much as it's been questioned and all this, all the loaded, you know, inferences that come with the, his questioning of his work ethic and mm-hmm. his cognitive ability, um, do you believe he's the guy to lead you? Because if he is, you you stand pat. That that tweet doesn't mean anything. Um, but we know, you know, that there's nonstop burner phones, yeah. tweet like uh, little side messages between GMs, the guys at the combine, regional scouts saying this, saying that. And so anything can happen. I, nothing should surprise anyone. Um, so this, this tweet should not give you comfort, yeah. and it should not make your head spin. It's, oh, and then yeah. if something happens, it shouldn't surprise you. I, I'm waiting for the leaks that I can't wait to ignore when people start talking about someone's S2 score or how Bruh. they are, they're not leaders, they aren't that smart. When all that stuff starts coming out, I know that it's somebody working to move somebody up or move somebody down for whatever reason. But in this particular ca- case – The only thing that makes sense, which is a roundabout way to do this, is that they are trying to shop their pick. That's the only Mm. thing that makes sense to me. But this is a real roundabout way to say we're interested in other quarterbacks, so we're going to get our social media department to (laughs) pretend like we might want to move on from Kyler, which makes me seem crazy for thinking that this makes sense. But it doesn't seem to make sense to actually move on from Kyler. Beginning of the season, I thought they were taking yeah, for the purpose of – Yeah, if you wanted to move on – if you actually wanted to move on from Kyler, then you don't bring him back. You don't win any games. You don't – yeah, you don't trade your pick to the uh, Texans or uh, – who they trade their pick to? Because they would The Texans to the, traded to them the, their pick. Oh, but how did the – How did the they move Browns, back, right? I mean, the Bears got their pick from – Carolina the Panthers. The Panthers. That's yeah, right. Yeah. That's the Panthers. I'm mixing up other teams. Cardinals that are had terrible. two picks. We thought yeah. the we thought the Texans right, right, were right. also going to be bad. Yep. Yeah, but yeah, it does. It doesn't seem to make sense if that was their strategy. This is pretty late in the game to decide that you want to be just good enough to be out of the running for the two top quarterbacks, and then we're going to trade to get the third or maybe fourth quarterback. That just doesn't make sense. Which, I guess, being dumb is. I, I, it's possible. I too. love that you also just mixed up the only two five nine quarterbacks. You're like, surprise, Young yeah, and yeah, Kyler yeah, Murray. Yeah, I'm sorry, they're they're not five nine, they're five ten. Yeah, so is that, so is every five nine guy. Oh, <laughs> uh, anyway, well, this, this has been fun, Russell. Uh, Russell, jeez, what the hell am I thinking? Who's, who's on your mind? Hold on, hold on, hold on. We gotta we gotta dive into this. Who, yeah. who, who, who are you thinking about? Fortunately, we are via Zoom, so you can't get your hands on me, Marshall <laughs> Newhouse. Thank you so much for joining us, my man. I appreciate. It. We do it again sometimes. I appreciate it, man. Yeah, anytime. All right, thanks, Charlie. Thanks, Podville. Thanks, Megan. Thanks, Serafina. Brian, Kevin, Cortez, mom and dad, chickens, ducks, cats, elderly people, and twerkers. We out. This is the Dominique Foxworth Show.